Hello everybody, this video then uh, will take you through the poem Tissue from 2006 by the uh, pa Pakistani Glasgow poet Intiaz Darker. Um, she is a, a, a woman, so um, yes, uh, a few brief points of context, there's not a huge amount to go over this one, uh, but as you'll see here, born in uh, Pakistan in 1954, although came to Glasgow before she was one year old. Um, although she does actually now divide her time between um, between uh, the UK and India, so she's very much somebody who has a rich sort of cultural um, heritage. Now, the only kind of general theme related to her life that's worth noting is this idea that she is inspired by uh, her own rich heritage, and that's of these these countries. One other thing of note. Now, uh, in 1947. India, which at that time included Pakistan, had not yet become independent, but but, um, but India as a whole, including Pakistan, became independent from uh, the British Empire. However, what that then did was trigger a long period of instability, which culminated in civil wars, um, which led to, first of all, Pakistan becoming independent from India, and then also Bangladesh as a third country breaking away from what had historically been the one large country of India. So in other words, she was born at a time of great instability in her own country, and that's something that's worth bearing in mind in the context of this poem. Um, one other note, now, uh, the examiners have stated that they would never name tissue as a named poem on the exam. You'll recall, of course, that you get one named poem printed on the exam, and then you have a free choice of your second poem. They've said that they would never do that because it seemed to be probably one of the more difficult, or probably the most difficult poems um, in the anthology, and certainly the hardest one, I think, to write about well. So that's something to bear in mind. I can only think of, in the last sort of, um, five years or so that this exam has been in operation, I can only think of one student that I know of that has chosen to write on this poem. And in the particular case of that student, it was somebody who said, I'm, I'm going to do it because I know that not many other people will. So, um, but nonetheless, I, st I still think overall that the risks of writing about it probably outweigh the uh, advantages. But I'll leave you to make your mind up for yourself. Now, just wait a moment for the uh, slide to move on. It may take a second. Here we are. Now, a few key pieces of vocabulary then before we begin this poem. Um, first of all then, uh, sepia, which can be used either as an, a noun or an adjective, but it relates to that sort of yellowy, creamy kind of colour that we associate with old photographs, as you'll see from the example on the top right. Um, secondly, uh, the idea of a capital. Uh, now, in this context, it means the ornamental head of a column. I mean, traditionally, it's something that is associated with um, ancient Greek and ancient Roman architecture principally, um, although the Egyptians used them as well, and lots of cultures since have borrowed them as a style. Um, I'll explore a bit more about that uh, in the poem itself. And finally, the word monolith. Now, literally, uh, a monolith is a structure made of a single stone, and you'll see the picture there the examples that being some of the ones, uh, the columns at Stonehenge. Um, but more metaphorically, it's also used to refer to anything that is large and indestructible, and it's used in that context in the poem. Before we begin then, it's very important, I think, for this poem even more than most, to think about the title, Tissue. What does that suggest to us? And you might want to pause and just brainstorm some ideas here. Assuming that you have done that, um, here are a few initial thoughts from me. First of all, um, tissue is a word that is used to refer to flesh, to, to the sort of soft parts of your body. So it has that association with humanity. Um, and because, of course, it exp explicitly refers to the soft parts, it can be seen to be associated with our weakness or our vulnerability as well. So this is going to be a poem that's got something to do with humans. Secondly, then, the idea of tissue as being um, paper, um, something, but again, something which is uh, thin, fragile, 
easily damaged, transient, you know, it's uh, used and then discarded. Um, and it, it can be used as an adjective, of course, you know, tissue thin, for example, or tissue, or like, or, you know, like tissue paper in an adjectival phrase, it can be used to refer to something that is thin and fragile. Um, what I will say about this is that the extended metaphor of the tissue runs through this poem, but its meanings shift. So it's not like I can simply say to you, it means this. It has different associations at different points in the poem. So it's very important that we are alert to that. Uh, and my suggestion is that after you have annotated the poem, come back to this and make a complete list of the shifting meanings of this metaphor that you will see. So let's move on now to the poem itself. First of all, I will begin by reading it through and then I will go back and talk over it. So, tissue. Paper that lets the light shine through. This is what could alter things. Paper thinned by age or touching. The kind you find in well-used books. The back of the Quran, where a hand has written in the names and histories. Who was born to whom. The height and weight. Who died where and how. On which sepia date. Pages smoothed and stroked and turned transparent with attention. If buildings were paper... I might feel their drift, see how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the direction of the wind. Maps too. The sun shines through their border lines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain folds, fine slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card, might fly our lives like paper kites. An architect could use all this, Place layer over layer, a luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block, but yet the daylights break through capitals and monoliths, through the shapes that pride can make. Find a way to trace a grand design with living tissue, raise a structure never meant to last, of paper smooth and stroked and thin to be transparent, turned into your skin. Now, let's then begin. Now, before we start uh, going through line by line, I will draw your attention to one key juxtaposition here. Because on the one hand, you have all the references to paper and fragility. But on the other hand, you also have a series of references to buildings, um, capitals, monoliths, of course, architects, building, blocks and bricks. That's an important juxtaposition, and in the course of our moving through this poem, I will try to uh, elucidate for you why I think that's significant. So, at the beginning then. Paper that lets the light shine through. This poem opens with an image of fragility. And because the title tells us that it's tissue, then we have already this metaphorical association between tissue, between paper, and people. So in other words, people are fragile, the paper is fragile, but what does the paper symbolise? Well, we go on to see that the paper, in this context, symbolises our heritage, our cultural inheritance. So when you look, for example, at the second stanza, and it talks about things like people writing in family names and histories and, and births in the back of a Quran, there's this sense then in which uh, our culture, or rather our heritage, our memories can be passed down in this way. But if they're written on paper, they are therefore fragile, and so these memories, this heritage, is something that's fragile, something that is easily damaged. Now this is where I think uh, we can associate this with Imtiaz Dhaka's, um, or Dhaka's background in civil war torn Pakistan, because um, clearly uh, that kind of, um, that kind, those kind of fears about well, what happens to our memories if, um, you know, we are killed, 
kill, <clears throat> if we are killed or we lose our possessions is clearly a, a, a major concern. So, the paper that lets the light shine through. Think about that verb phrase, the idea of the light shining through. Again, emphasises the fragility. But look, this is what could alter things. In other words, suggesting that if people went for peaceful methods, perhaps, uh, rather than violence, by writing, for example, that would be a way that we can effect change, not by violence. Paper thinned by age or touching. Look at that adjectival phrase. Look at the verb thin there. Um, the emphasis is again, so for the second time in this first stanza, on um, its fragility. The kind you find in well-used books, again, emphasises the age. So you've got age now, you've got the fact that they're well-used. Um, and then in the third stanza, it also mentions a sepia date. So that's three separate quotations that demonstrate the kind of age, if you like, of our uh, heritage, um, which is also being shown to be so fragile. Now, clearly, with the reference to the back of the Quran, um, Clearly, it's her Muslim heritage that she is thinking about primarily, but I would argue that um, this applies just as much to any other culture. It's a very universal method. And in fact, it wasn't a tradition, um, uh, certainly in England that I'm aware of, uh, of uh, in the past families would have a large copy of the Bible when such a thing was a quite a rare and expensive item. Um, and again, much like it describes here, would use it to record um, date, dates and deaths in the family so that it becomes a kind of living family tree as well. Um, and I think that's very much what's being written here. Um, so, um, we see that now. Uh, we talked earlier about the further references to age and there's one more in that third stanza when it talks about how the pages are smoothed and stroked and turned and you might note that polysynthetic list there that, that has in the multiple use of and um, and turn transparent with attention so it links again back to the thinness of the paper now a quick comment or two about form and structure now you will see here that most of this poem, with the exception of the final stanza, is written in these quatrains, in these four-line stanzas. And again, that much in the way that I suppose we can look at people and think that they are superficially alike, it's the same with these stanzas. It gives a kind of illusion of regularity, but actually when we start to look at these, we will see that the, um, the metre, for example, is irregular. We can't say that it's all... You know, eight lines to a uh, eight um, eight syllables to a line, or ten syllables to a line, or anything like that. The meter is irregular, and similarly, there is quite a lot of uh, enjambment as well. And even if you notice between the first um, and second, and then the second and third stanzas, never mind the lines, which I think reflects both the irregularity of life, the way that life resists these attempts to uh, restrict it, um, but also I think um, the uh, perhaps you can argue that it links to the idea of paper itself fluttering as something which is insubstantial. However, having said that there is quite a lot of enjambment, at the end of this third stanza it is end stopped and the poem does seem to move into a different phase, if you will, a different um, mode. So. It begins with a conditional phrase then, um, not therefore about something that's realistic, but it's speculating. If buildings were paper, I might feel their drift, see how easily they fall away on a sigh, a shift in the directions of the wind. Now, for Darka here, she seems to have this juxtaposition, as I said, between paper and buildings. Um, now, I think for her, she sees buildings, strangely, as a sign of oppression. Now, that might seem strange, because, let's face it, first of all, we tend to think about buildings as being a form of shelter. Uh, 
Uh, but I think that particularly on the way it's set out on this slide, the second column, um, when she's talking about things like um, uh, about grand designs, about capitals and monoliths, I think she's talking about the way that architecture is often used as a tool of oppression or a symbol of oppression. Um, I mean, there is an example in Ozymandias in the way in which that statue is built. But clearly here, Darker is criticising that kind of arrogance. Um, but particularly in the 20th century, it's been a trait of the great dictators. Hitler, obviously, in Germany, Mussolini in Italy, uh, Stalin in, in Russia, uh, and even people like Ceausescu in Romania, um, where all of these figures have very much used their architecture, used their building as a tool to control and to oppress the populace. So Dark is criticising that. It's almost as if then here she's saying that if these buildings were paper, in other words, if people weren't trying to impose structures on us, um, it's almost as if she also therefore sees this reference to tissues as being a kind of metaphor for freedom, um, or at least freedom from oppression. Um, and she goes on and that stanza is on, is end stopped and then she moves on to the second um stop stop stanza of this section um and she's made the connection with buildings and now she starts to talk about maps now i think for imtiaz darker that maps again is a symbol of oppression of control a map is made by someone sitting down somewhere and drawing a line and saying right you know this is one country this is another um so for her, it's another tool of oppression and another source of conflict. Because she goes on, maps too. So explicitly, with that um, uh, word too, it's explicitly linked back to the stanza before. Um, and this, equally the idea of oppression. The sun shines through their borderlines, the marks that rivers make, roads, rail tracks, mountain falls. So again, with the reference of the sun shining through, um, there's quite a clear parallel to the first couplet of this poem, the light shines through, here the sun shines through. But again, it's this emphasis, the fact that m maps are a tool for control, but she's trying to um, argue that they are actually, f they, are, they are sort of fundamentally flimsy, they should be discarded. Um, it's also worth noting in this poem, the significance of light uh, how often that's used in a kind of optimistic sort of sense. Um, but we move on then. On the next stanza, find slips from grocery shops that say how much was sold and what was paid by credit card might fly our lives like paper kites. Now again, she's talking about receipts, these slips. But for her, clearly, these receipts seem like a third symbol of oppression. Um, the idea that we become slaves to money, you know, in our capitalist society. Um, this seems to be something that she objects to. So in a sense then, they're now in this, I suppose in these three stanzas, we have a sequence of the three things, the buildings, the maps, and these receipts that um, she uses almost like um, in a kind of cumulative way to represent um, the uh, power and, um, and, and, and oppression that she is objecting to. And this is what I mean when I say that it's sort of shifted, because the, it, you can't pin down the idea of it as you mean one particular thing at one particular point. But she wants freedom, and you can see that from the final line of that stanza, because she says that these receipts, quote, might fly our lives like paper kites. Obviously, this is a simile, but you can look at that verb fly and of course that has all the associations of freedom you can look at what um getting rid of them is being compared to these paper kites paper kites obviously is something that can are sort of relatively free and that can fly um in that sense and the fact that they're made of paper they're cheap they're um widely available to all and actually they're something that are particularly popular in certain parts of um this kind of um, Southeast Asian culture. If anybody's ever read the uh, novel The Kite Runner or seen the film, um, you'll see that that's, um, you'll see that represented there. 
Um, but so paper kites, something that everyone can do, not like money, something that's restricted, something that represents freedom, what she wants. Now in this final section of the poem, Darker goes on to talk about um, part of what her vision about what the world could be like will be. Um, and so she says then, an architect could use all this. Remember we've talked about the link between architects and buildings. In Darker's world, architects seem to be associated with oppression. Again, this building of buildings that are built to restrict people, control their lives. Um, but she says, could use all this, place layer over layer, luminous script over numbers over line, and never wish to build again with brick or block. Now, this is clearly metaphorical, the idea that she could build in paper, because the structures that she's talking about clearly would be greatly insubstantial if they existed. But again, it's her idea about a society that is designed around people, a society that thinks about people first, rather than something that is building this idea of these fixed, immovable, unchangeable and unchanging buildings. Notice again, with the, the adjective luminous, you have a yet another reference to images of light, which we've mentioned earlier. Um, and that's something significant there. In that line, you've got notice layer over layer, luminous. And then on the next line as well, um, these are what we call fluid um, consonant sounds. Um, and again, I suppose in a sense, it represents this idea of freedom and free movement that you can link back to all sorts of things, like the use of the irregular meter, like the use of the irregular enjambment. Um, so, in, so you, you can link both the language like that and also um, the, uh, the structure and the form like that to make a very sort of sophisticated point about the um, about about the sort of freedom that she wishes for. So, brick or block, those heavy plosives, in contrast to the fluid vowel sounds that we've just talked about, um, brick or block, and then on that line, daylight break. Um, on the one hand, with those heavy plosives, she's emphasising the oppressive nature of um, these uh, buildings and these structures. But again, let daylight break, she wants it to, uh, as it were, um, uh, destroy them. She wants something better in their place. Through capitals and monoliths, these features of these um, great, large um, buildings. And this is where uh, the idea of the monolith in the metaphorical sense comes in. Um, because this idea of um, buildings that are very large and very sort of um, permanent looking, she describes them as sort of monoliths because that's what they seem like, something that cannot be uh, easily destroyed. But she's saying, let it happen. Let the light break through it. And she calls these buildings, and I suppose this line, in a way, ties together all the views on buildings. She calls them the shapes that pride can make. And so, by extension, if she associates these buildings with pride, which we can link to hubris, which once again is a good link to things like, for example, Ozymandias, um, then in contrast, I suppose, what we can say is that she, not only is she asking for a more free existence, but an existence that is more humble, that shows more humility, which of course is, is the opposite of pride. Um, and linking to that, the shapes that pride can make, and she calls them grand designs. Again, hubristic ideas. I don't think she's talking about the, you know, the popular uh, television program. Um, but a, a, a tra trace a grand design with living tissue, as in with people, putting people and their well-being first. And in this plan, then, she says, what then? Raise a structure never meant to last. She doesn't want these kind of permanent memorials like these buildings. In the end, it's people that she's interested in. And yes, she begins by stating that 
people are fragile, and yet, in a way, I suppose that is what makes them all the more worth preserving, according to her. It's precisely because they're fragile that they should be preserved. So, trace a grand design with living tissue. Hence, this is where the metaphor from being about paper sort of melts back into the idea of it being like um, people. Um, Ray's instruction never meant to last of paper smooth and stroked and thinned to be transparent. See how this alludes back to earlier on. In fact, that line, paper smooth and stroked, um, is a, almost a direct quote from the third line in the third stanza. So, so she's explicitly now bringing this poem back almost cyclically to where it was earlier on. Paper smooth and stroked and turned to, and thinned to be transparent turned into your skin. And so there, like the reference to the living tissue, um, it's this idea that in the end she's making it explicit by the way that the two metaphors almost grow together, um, making it explicit that she sees the tissue to be as we said right at the beginning, representative both of people, but also of um, the kind of cultures and the inheritances that they bring with them. And that really concludes our note on this poem. So, subheadings for your notes then. This is what you need to make sure that you have clearly covered. So, the topic of the poem, you need to make sure that you've got some notes on roughly what this poem is about. I appreciate that's not particularly straightforward, because of the nature of it. But I suppose you will need to say something along the lines of how um, it is an exploration of the fragility of um, people and cultures and why it is worth preserving. In the end, I suppose that's what it is about. Um, notes on the form and structure, so talking about the use of the quatrains, the enchantments, um, the irregular metre, um, structure well the poem ultimately of course is structured on the kind of shifting sands as it were of this changing a metaphor of the tissues uh, or of the of the tissue um, and particularly the way that they grow together in the end the two senses of it as human and as and, and, and as heritage the way that they kind of grow together and it's quite an optimistic poem because it is seeking to look to the future um, and to the way that a better world might look so these are the sort of things you might have. Hopefully you've already got an annotated copy of the poem because you should have just done that. And then on the next slide I've got some clusters for you. Now there's not many clusters for this poem, um, but they are quite um, that they do probably require quite a lot of detail for each. So again, please ensure that these are fully detailed, like the partial example that I've got here, which means reference to quotations and to the methods that I use. So my four points are human life is fragile and easily destroyed heritage is fragile and easily destroyed you'll probably find by the way that that will overlap quite a lot with the uh, first point so lots of the quotations for these two you can put arrows between them but there might be some that will be separate um, too often society is neglectful of human individuals so this is where you'll bring in some of the imagery to do with buildings and things like that and finally, about the poet looking to how society could be improved. So mainly towards the end of the poem, you'll be bringing in things there. Um, on the subject of the first point then, let's just look briefly at some of the notes I've written down. So, um, what else then? Um, I, human life is fragile and easily destroyed. I've put down as my first quotation, paper that lets the light shine through. And the key thing there is that verb phrase, shine through. Um, Paper thinned by age or touching. Again, you might link that verb thinned to the previous point. Um, and transparent with attention. Again, that adjective transparent all links to this, the idea of paper so thin that it can be seen through. And I suppose on this note, you could start to talk about the significance of the light imagery, like shine as well. Um, so this is just partial. Obviously, there are a lot more quotations that you'll need for this point and then for the three points afterwards as well. So I hope that you found this useful. Thank you very much indeed for your attention. And that concludes this video on the poem tissue.